Runt Takes the Cake. Chapter 1 Get the lead out, Runtowski, Mr. Nordman, our phys ed teacher, shook the rope that Runt was climbing. Runt lost his grip and fell. The class gasped. Runt landed on the mat, somersaulted into a standing position, and took a bow, turning the gasps to laughter. Nordman muttered something under his breath and said to Runt, Drop and give me twenty. To us, he said, and that goes for the rest of you ladies, too. Nordman was telling us what a flabby bunch of wissies we were when he fell silent. We looked up in the middle of push-up number 15 to see him clutch his chest, turn purple, and fall face down on the hardwood floor. We all stood there in shock while Runt felt Nordman's neck for a pulse. Who has a cell phone? he asked. We were all in our gym shorts. No one had one. Runt reached into Nordman's pocket, yanked out his cell, and dialed 911. He's not breathing, I said. Runt and I tried rolling the bodybuilder onto his back, but we were like chihuahuas trying to budge a beached whale. It took six ginormous guys to roll Nordman over so Runt could try CPR. It wasn't perfect, but he got Nordman breathing. The first paramedics to arrive shoved Runt out of the way, put Nordman on oxygen, hoisted him onto the gurney, and wheeled him out to the waiting ambulance. The rest of the class followed, leaving Runt and me staring after them. You're welcome, Runt said to no one in particular. Chapter 2 Mr. Nordman died of cardiac arrest before the ambulance got to the hospital, which surprised Runt, given Nordman's superb physical condition. Had to be foul play, he mused, as we fought our way through the crowd at the cemetery to pay our respects on this foggy February day. Humongous mourners, former football players whom Mr. Nordman had coached over the years, huddled round the coffin. We couldn't penetrate the offensive line to reach the graveside, and were getting bored. Runt nudged me and whispered, Look over your shoulder. I turned. There stood Mr. Sloth, our biology teacher, the school's hardest grader, widely known and hated as the Flunkinator. Rumor had it that Nordman and Sloth had had a nasty confrontation when Sloth failed Nordman's star halfback, disqualifying him before the league championship. Some kids said they had come to blows, but I doubt that. Nordman could have pounded the tall but muscle-free Sloth into library paste. What's Sloth smirking about? I wondered aloud. Not him. Runt whispered, pointing to a figure farther away. Her. A tall woman lurked behind a tree. Her black veil obscured a bony, chalk-white face, dark eyebrows, and blood-red lips. Her luminous skin sucked all the light out of the day. The next day in the cafeteria, a moody Runt picked at his food. To cheer him up, I said, Eat, bro! It may be barfeteria slop, but for some reason it's tasty. It was true. Lately the food here was scrumptious. Nobody brought their own lunch anymore. Even teachers were standing in line. Having hair-netted ladies serve you food you actually enjoyed was like experiencing a total eclipse of the sun. Is so good, I said, showing him the gross wad of chewed chicken casserole in my mouth. Don't you want to grow up to be big and strong like me? I teased. Runt ignored me. That lady we saw yesterday. I've seen her before, he said. Yeah, she seemed familiar, but I'm drawing a blank. Runt brightened. That's it, the blank fire. Half the town was at the blank fire last month, I reminded him. Runt and I had suffered in Mr. Blank's English class, but his horrific end was undeserved. You could see the blaze from Space Station One. Wait a minute, you're right, 
my memory flashed on a woman at the edge of the crowd, her black eyes fixed on the fire. Her bone-white face was hard to miss, even in the dark. Sloth was there that night as well, I said. He and Blank didn't exactly get along either. I once had to take a message to the teacher's lounge and walked in on the middle of a shouting match. Really? I had Runt's interest now. I actually knew something Runt didn't. I savored this rare moment. Yeah, Blank had called him a dolphin killer. They were having some kind of fight over animal rights. Interesting, Runt said. Sloth fights with two teachers. Two teachers die. Chapter 3 It was early morning as we navigated the twisted corridors of Belmore High's subterranean service areas. Inquiring minds demanded to know the source of the cafeteria's culinary excellence. The school paper's editor assigned its star reporter, me, to interview Chef Clarissa Nisser. I had cajoled Runt into coming along to be my photographer. Why did we have to come here before school, he grumbled. Because it's the only time she would agree to the interview. Principal Latimer had to beg her to talk to us, I replied. Ms. Nisser was bent over a sink, rinsing pots in the kitchen. As I set up my recorder on a table, I said, I'm Eddie Stedman from the Belmore Bell Ringer. Your fans want to know all about you. Really? Why me? Ms. Nisser put the pot in the dishwasher and turned to face us. Runt and I were gawking at our chalk-white lady. I managed to return my jaw to a closed position and stammered, Um, we're in awe of your culinary genius. That chicken at lunch yesterday was superb. Can the students expect more of the same? Clarissa Nisser turned out to be very nice, but Runt took only a few shots of her during our interview. He spent way too much time shooting utensils and cupboards. It turned out that Ms. Nisser had switched careers from nursing to cooking. She studied at a prestigious cooking school in France, but turned down offers from five-star restaurants to work here. When I asked her why, she said she wanted to use her expertise to improve the quality of Belmore's education by raising the quality of the cuisine. Good nutrition feeds your brain, she smiled. Speaking of brains, I need someone to take this chocolate cake to Mr. Sloth. When she saw the puzzled look on my face, she said, I'm afraid Mr. Sloth and I had a bit of a misunderstanding recently. Since it's his birthday, I thought this cake would help patch things up. I almost told her that the cake might just save her life, but kept my mouth shut. All Runt and I had were half-baked theories. No pun intended. Runt volunteered to deliver the treat, and then the bell rang for first period. Chapter 4 By the time I got out of band practice, it was already getting dark. I took the shortcut through the parking lot and was rounding the side of a delivery truck parked behind the cafeteria when a bony hand grabbed my arm. Your little friend never delivered my cake. Ms. Nisser's livid face loomed out of the shadows. She was trying to smile, but I could see panic in her eyes. Oh, hey, Ms. Nisser, I said. He probably just forgot about it and left it in his locker. He better not have touched it, she cooed. That was specially prepared for Mr. Sloth. I'll find out what happened to it, I said. Her talons were digging into my arm. Here's my number. She thrust a piece of paper into my hands. Call me as soon as you find out anything. She ran off toward her car. As I walked into the oncoming darkness, I blamed the wind for sending icy fingers down my spine. Home was across town a jillion miles away, and I was alone. Then something lurched at me from behind a tree. Eddie, it said. Yeah, 
I screamed, trying to sound less like a terrified five-year-old girl when I saw it was runt, by adding, Where's Nisser's cake? She's about to string you up. It's where it should be, he said calmly. At the crime lab. It was poisoned. Runt had been a busy, busybody that day. Before school started, he called his dad about his suspicions about Ms. Nisser. Detective Runtowski refused to waste police department resources to follow up on his son's wild hunch, but he had a suggestion. Mr. Slothe was a scientist. Why not have him run the test himself? Mr. Sloth rose to the challenge and discovered the cake contained high levels of succinylcholine, a drug that can cause cardiac arrest. You can only get it in hospitals, Runt explained. Nisser would have had access to the stuff from her days as a nurse. What tipped you off, I asked. This, he said, whipping out his digital camera and clicking to those kitchen cupboard shots. Runt had pushed aside the usual cooking ingredients so the camera could capture the collection of poisons hidden in the back. The gourmet food was just bait, to get the teachers to start eating at the cafeteria. That would explain why Mr. Nordman, the triathlete, died of a heart attack, I said. Dad's going to order an autopsy on Mr. Blanc, too. He was in that blaze, but I'll bet there isn't any smoke in his lungs. I'm thinking she poisoned him, then started the fire. Okay, I conceded, but why? Dad finally got interested when Sloth found the poison, so he ran the fingerprints on the cake box. The database search produced someone who looked like Ms. Nisser. Only the name was Velma Montez. That name sounds familiar, I said. My oldest brother, Ryan, remembered her son, Ray Montez, Runt said. He dropped out of school and eventually wound up in prison. Could be Mrs. Montez blamed the teachers. I grimaced. I hope you're wrong. Why is that? Because if they put Nisser away, we're back to cafeteria food as usual. <laughs>